All right, I'm going to kind of go in a different direction. I'm actually going to not deal with weather or uh, impacts. I'm going to be looking more at a disease event that resulted in a large generation of mortalities in the state of Maine, and um, hopefully uh, give you some insights on how we dealt with it and um, ways to deal with things going forward. Okay, so let's see here. Um, here we go. So in the state of Maine, there are four uh, major seal varieties. Uh, this event actually affected the first two, the harbor seal and the gray seal. And when we start talking about uh, Maine, it's mostly all rocky coastal area. Uh, we have a high tourism and one of the things people come to see are seals. So um, one of the things that we try to do is uh, take care of any potential mortalities when they occur so as not to affect the, um, the viewing impact of folks that come along. But traditionally, most of the impacts that occur are very small and, and local. Uh, we have situations occurring with haul outs where an animal will pull itself out of the water for a period of time and either um, will die from a predation event or from some sort of exposure. We have pups that get left on a rock by their mom when she goes out to feed and then she forgets where they are and they end up uh, dying of malnutrition. Uh, we have entanglements where uh, lobster traps and fishing nets will capture animals and they'll drown as uh, seals do as mammals need to breathe there. Uh, we have boat strikes, which, which uh, happen quite frequently, especially in the shipping lanes, as these tend to be the navigation lanes that the animals use as well. And then of course, the old dreaded disease outbreak where these can be quite uh, impactful. In 2018, what we had was a really sudden uptick in seal mortalities, especially during the month of July, August, and September. And this was uh, the result of a widespread disease vector known as focine distemper. Uh, it was quite uh, significant in the state of Maine and resulted in us kind of really ramping up our efforts to try and respond. The stranding sites covered the entire coast, but were mostly concentrated in the lower southern portion of the state. And that's uh, basically, this is Maine from here on up through, from there on up through. I worked with my colleagues at Marine Mammal, uh, Marine Mammals of Maine. They do uh, root seal rehabilitation, but they also help with mortality management of seals, which is quite a, a chore, especially given an event like this. So as I said, the focine distemper virus was our, our concern that caused all the problems. However, they, they were trying to figure out why the animals suddenly were affected by focine distemper. And there were lots of thoughts that went around. One was that uh, the seals were molting at the time, which requires quite a bit of energy, making them immunocompromised. Uh, also, there's the thought that the Gulf of Maine the waters are warming and there are lots of toxicants that are moving around in the waters and there might be an amplified effect. And then the other was just that this was a really strong virulent, uh, virulent strain of the virus. The concern that we had is we get a lot of tourists from out of state that bring their dogs to the beaches. And most times these dogs are not vaccinated for distemper. Uh, uh, and so as a result, animals uh, running into these dead seals, rolling all over them, it was a huge potential for a distemper transmission. So what we did is we uh, started thinking about this and then we put it to the uh, top of the list when NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration declared an unusual mortality event in August after a significant surge in mortalities that caused my department to get together and create a task force to try and address this issue. It included the main DEP, the Department of Agriculture, Department of Marine Resources that handles marine animals, the Maine Center for Disease Control because this was a communicable disease, uh, marine mammals of Maine because they were going to be the first line soldiers, and then NOAA itself come and help sort of supervise. As part of our meeting, we decided to develop a fact sheet and get about as much education out as possible so that we could get the public thinking about this and, and becoming kind of the sentinels for us. And then simultaneously, I sat down with my supervisor and created a set of guidance that we could use to help sort of come up with some options to deal with mortalities. 
This is an example of the fact sheet that was put together by the CDC. They tried for an eighth grade reading level. They tried to make it very interesting so that people would pick it up and look at it. But the whole idea was basically, if you see a dead seal, call somebody, don't touch it. This is a, a very um, busy slide, but this is our, our plan. We developed two options. One was composting and the other was above ground burial. And we ended up using composting 100% of the time. We placed it on our webpage because people often turn to our webpage for information. And so we had both a marine mammal fact sheet and the guidance for the animal composting to try and give people an opportunity to reach out. We had all kinds of options on the table at the meeting. Uh, the ones in the top, toe and sink, remove and bury, bury on site, all are time intensive and they take a tremendous amount of resources to deal with just one animal. So they just weren't things that we were interested in pursuing. Uh, when you take animals out to sea and you sink them, they often pop up and become a navigational hazard. Uh, incineration, alkaline digestion, and rendering all were single batch, low throughput options that we just couldn't even begin to address. So very quickly, composting was the most important option because we knew we could get that done quickly and we could address a lot of animals at one time. We also looked at using agricultural lime in extreme cases where the animals were unable to be extracted. So some of the things that, that had to happen right away was I set up a site assessment protocol, a carbon quality assessment, so I could figure out what resources were available in the, in the specific areas. I would be required to go to every site and oversee windrow construction. And then I would be available for monitoring and troubleshooting any potential windrow performances. We were looking at daily record keeping just to keep an idea of the temperatures to kill the, the potential pathogen. And then finally, we needed to know what we were gonna do with the material when it was done. These were all the, the things that came up to, to task. I put together a protocol for looking at siting criteria. We needed to make sure that it wasn't in a populated area that we put it in an area where there would be no concern for run on coming on to cause leachate. We had to have a good slope to the site so that we could potentially have precipitation wash off instead of going through the animals. It couldn't be on a floodplain and it had to be big enough to handle all the animals. The soils had to be moderately well drained. Uh, we needed to have a good distance to the seasonal high water table and a good distance to bedrock so as not to pollute groundwater. This became very, very cumbersome. And so we instead decided that we would reach to these communities that had existing compost operations. They already had the site, it was already permitted, it was a good solid base, and they were composting leaf and yard, which was a fairly hot material. I had never used it before, but my thought was that if I could get these animals into biologically active material, I would be able to break the carcasses down quicker, have a good chance to, to hit the virus with some hot temperatures and kill it off and really make things work out. So we had eight communities that were all fairly uh, significantly impacted by the amount of mortalities and they all happened to have existing licensed permitting sites. So I started working with them and things worked out exceptionally well. I set up a protocol where a, a citizen or a policeman or someone would find a seal, they'd immediately call police dispatch. The police dispatch would reach out to my friends at Marine Mammals of Maine to come down and check the animal out, get some data from it for uh, use in, in take a sample to check for the distemper. And then they would contact me to let me know it had been processed. And I would come down, talk to Public Works and we'd get that animal over to the compost site We'd build the pile right away, put the animal in it and get it covered and let it start cooking. Now, normally we do this for about a two week period and then we give the pile a flip to keep it aerobic. But Noah was very concerned about this distemper virus. So they requested that we not touch the piles for six weeks. So once again, having a really hot biologically active material was essential to make sure that we had everything done correctly. This is an example of an animal we couldn't get to extricate from the site. It was on a rocky shoreline. So what I did is I added lime to the top of the animal 
and I coated it sort of like a powdered donut. And what advantages we had was immediately suppressed odors. So it kept vectors like seagulls and other animals away. It discouraged flies, but it also allowed the animal to naturally degrade underneath it by creating a crusty covering. And so as the animal broke down, each tide that came through flushed away the nutrients and it became a really neat way to let it decompose without having to worry about it. So the process for the composting was we made a nice bed about 24 inches thick by usually eight feet in diameter. That's about a good wide enough berth for the seals. And this is just a shot. Here's two seals in one compost pile. And so a nice 24 inch base. And then we put at least 24 to 36 inches of hot cover on top to ensure the animal would start decomposing right away. You get a lot of microbiological activity and any potential odors would not penetrate to attract animals. Uh, it, it worked exceptionally well. I was very, very impressed with the leaf and yard composting. So as I said, biologically active material in, in Maine, our, our go-to is horse bedding. It's horse manure and shavings and some urine. It usually comes out of the stalls about 160. We now also have leaf and yard, which I'm a big fan of. And then the other one, we produce about uh, somewhere around 900,000 cubic yards of hot sludge compost annually. And that material is biologically active as well and could be used in a pinch for disease uh, management. This is just a shot of a pile completed. This one actually has three seals in it. And as you can see, we got a lot of good press. The press came and, and, and helped us out, which was really excellent. This is an example of the bed being formed and it's basically just scraping it down and, and spreading it out and keeping it very biologically active. And then this is actually after six weeks, this is what remained of the seals, which is mostly bone and some soft tissue and I call it goop, but it's basically just the pink slimy material, but the majority of the soft tissue had been uh, metabolized or had been broken down by the microbes and we ended up with a really decent material. So what we did is we actually turned it with a loader and the result was that we made it biologically active again. And so we let it cook for another you know, couple of weeks until we ended up with a dark rich material that the NOAA did not want us to distribute because it had the bones of marine mammals in it. But we actually were able to crush most of those bones with the loader. So we started using it around town in general public works kind of items, but it, it does an exceptional job. And this is our go-to for if it happens again. And I was just contacted the other day by the state of Massachusetts, helping them with two seals to compost those. And they both had full side distemper. So there's a real strong possibility we may be experiencing this again. And this is just a pile of the finished material ready for distribution and utilization. And it's just a really great way to manage mortalities. We put this, this uh, whole process plus other work that I've done. We published this in uh, the National Marine Fisheries NOAA group as a guide to composting marine animal mortalities. It's actually available online if you look for it. And uh, it's just something that we hope will be utilized across the country.